Hello again. Welcome to the Vandy Sports Roundtable edition of the podcast. I'm your host, Chris Lee, joined by Billy Derrick, also of Vandy Sports, and our usual Thursday guest, Luke White. We'll we'll find something to talk about. Luke suggested bowling and golf. We, we may go there, but I suspect we won't. Anyway, reminder, basketball season is presented by the Wash House. Are you dreading laundry day? Is it stealing time to do the things that you truly enjoy? Let the laundry professionals at the Wash House take care of that for you. With two convenient locations in the Nashville area, the greater Nashville area, just drop off your dirty laundry and our professional attendants can give you back the one thing you can never have enough of. That's your time. Within 24 hours, you can pick up your nicely folded, fresh, clean laundry ready to be put away. Check out washhouseclean.com. Stop in today. Get your time back. Say hello to Stephen Andrews if you see him. He runs that business. Big Vanderbilt fan. Good friend of mine for about 20 years. Wonderful human being. And please help out those who help the podcast. That also includes the Murfreesboro Pure Milk Company, our baseball sponsor. They are a family-owned third-generation milk and ice cream distribution company located in Murfreesboro. A partnership began over 50 years ago with Purity Dairy and Purity Dairy in Nashville to provide milk and ice cream to consumers in Middle Tennessee. They now also, also serve Southern Kentucky, Northern Alabama, Chattanooga, North Georgia. So if you have any interest in those areas for vendor, please look up these guys. They supply grocery stores, convenience stores, others with purity products, as well as Mayfield, Nestle, haagen ice cream. For more information, visit their website at mpmci.com. Thank you to those guys, uh, Sutherland and Belk. John Levin and Yeaman Packaging Systems also will tell you a little bit more about those folks later in the show, but it has been a rough few years. Finally, we get to smell the roses a little bit today, and those are the folks who have helped keep us alive, so please show your appreciation to those folks, either verbally or doing business or whatever, but we could not have been here without them. All right, I'm just going to open the floor today. You've heard from Billy and I this week and also, Joey, our thoughts here and there about the game Saturday. Luke, I ran into you Saturday night walking to the press conference. Um, I just want to give you the floor to unpack the upset over Alabama, probably the biggest win in the history of the football program, certainly since you've been involved with it. And just give us the before, during, after, whatever you think is of interest to the folks. Well, you know, I've been involved in a lot of good, big wins over the years. I think of the the snapping the losing streak to Tennessee, the ESPN game day when we beat Auburn, uh, the the blowout of Tennessee under Franklin. There's been a lot of great days over there, but this one tops them all. And uh, I, I will say, I probably had more fun. I felt like a little kid again uh, when I was growing up being a Vanderbilt fan Saturday as old as I am, I felt like a little kid because after the game, uh, Tyler Unzicker, who I'm still recovering from him, squeezing me so hard. <laughs> uh, we went over with my wife and, uh, went and congratulated Clark and got her pictures done with Theo Vaughn. I think Theo was the one with Quincy Skinner that helped put the, yeah. uh, grade on coach. And we, we just had a great time. And, uh, I'm, I'm so happy for the kids and everybody involved, you know, I've taken a lot of abuse for being supportive of Clark by a lot of people that doubted me and say, well, what, you must not know much about football if you think Clark Lee can coach. Well, I think you see now how resilient he is as a coach and how he, uh, he had to fire a bunch of friends. And I've said this before on here, if you don't fire, if you don't get rid of your friends, you wind up with that five-year deal at Vanderbilt and then you're gone. And we've seen that with previous coaches. And so you, Clark credit for bringing it. Obviously, the offense has made the biggest difference. We understand that. But it's the entire package of keeping the, you know, you you keep chopping that wood, guys. You keep doing the same thing. There's no magic to it. It's like all you've seen on social media this week, you've seen behind the scenes. This one, you can see now what Clark was talking about when he first got here. And Chris and Billy and y'all, and I'm sure y'all may agree with this. I've, I've been there over 40. 
when Clark took it over, it was at the lowest ebb in the history of Vanderbilt football that I know of in the 40 years because of not just the football talent, but because of the administration, the shape the building was in, the shape the support was in. So, and then COVID and then NIL. So he's taken over in a transitional period. It's like walking into a, a middle of a storm. You know, you just try to get your bearings that first year. So this is really, to me, still Clark's third year. And I'm, uh, I, I'm just over the moon about Saturday night. It was a lot of fun for everybody involved, and I'm just happy for everybody. Yeah, I mean, you, you go back and, and you think about all the, all the things Clark went through, whether it was the first year. You know, second year obviously got a little bit better, but you know, last year, I'm sure that was the hardest year for him. And he talked about the the month of December being a very important month for this program. He locked himself in the room with people like Earl Bennett and 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 everybody, Barton Simmons, that's involved in in that was involved in making that win possible. I mean, the, I don't think Clark gets enough credit. You know, Diego Pavia obviously will get the the bulk of the credit. But Clark Lee brought in Tim Beck initially. That led to Jerry Kill. That led to Diego Pavia. You also brought in Chris Klanakis, who Diego Pavia has said that has been a massive addition. And that that's what kind of elevated Diego's belief within the offense. The strategic building of the offense from Clark Lee is what has, I think, built this, this win. And in the defense, you know, he was going to be taking it over. You know, the defense is obviously the the kind of the weaker link, but they made two huge plays and, and they've been opportunistic and, and it's it's led by Clark. So I, I don't I don't know that Clark is getting enough credit. He doesn't he doesn't want the credit, of course. He's he, you know, talked to him yesterday. I'm not I'm not trying to give myself too much credit here, but I, I think he deserves a ton of credit. Um it's not easy to go away from your process in one off season to quickly pivot and now this season all of a sudden you've knocked off the number one team in the country the goalposts are in the Cumberland River and you have the most historic win of your program um, and it really is remarkable in the video they released last night Chris just amplifies the belief that they have they had and the confidence that they had I mean Clark Lee in the video said it's happening CJ Taylor told Joey earlier in the week a lot of people are going to su be surprised by the result the pulse of the team that Clark has has been really impressive, which is why I'm interested in talking to him today. <laughs> I think the thing that stood out to me and, and Luke, you, you tell me, no, look, I was a little bit later in getting out of the press box than I usually am because I wanted to shoot the whole celebration thing. I mean, when you're watching and I, Billy, I told you guys that we're, we're watching history. I want us to get as much of it documented as we can and that's where i wanted our focus to shift i told you guys hey if you can get to the field or whatever and just turn your camera on and shoot whatever's there let, let's get it now i think we all had some reservations after talking it over that it might stop us from getting to the press conference uh which turned out it, it did not because it must have been an hour after the game before they finally yeah. got in there and and i think at that point absolutely nobody cared about that but I, I did sit, and if you haven't seen it, I documented the entire almost 15 minutes from the last, I don't know, the last minute and a half of game time, which went longer than that because of stoppages and stuff, and then to the moment they tore the goalposts down and stuff they did on the scoreboard. So if you just want to see it all and what it looked like from the press box, uh, you can check that out on our YouTube channel. It's had tens of thousands of views by now. But I think I thought that was important. Like, let's get this documented. But I think the thing that really resonated with me is I, as I'm going through, and I've said this elsewhere, but I don't know who's read or listened to what, so I'll repeat it here. When I was walking in that building, I had to go through the coaches' offices and stuff to get to the press conference because I, I physically could not get in where we normally go in. One thing that I noticed was like after big wins, you hear like these yelps and these screams and other parts of the building. And I kept waiting to hear those and I never did. And I thought they're, they're in shock. They really are. And then a day later, I, I started to thinking, you know, we had the CJ Taylor prediction that we're going to beat Alabama. You had other players hinting at it. 
and then you saw the, I don't know what they call it now, but it's their version of Revealed. And you saw Clark Lee's speech ahead of time. And it was about, we are going to win and we expect to win. And I think what I interpreted, Luke, you tell me if I'm wrong, and I'm, I'm sure they celebrated somewhere, but the videos in the locker room, it was not the unbridled jubilation that they had under James Franklin or one of those things. It was like, okay, we went and took care of business. I feel like what I was seeing was not a team that was shocked to win, but it was the opposite. It was a team that expected to win and was kind of ready to flip the page and maybe get another one this weekend. And am I close here? No, and I think you're exactly right. Now, again, being a part of all those celebrations over the years when we did have a big win or whatever it was, <clears throat> you know, a lot of times, can you believe that? You hear that a lot. Or, man, can you believe we beat Alabama or we beat Tennessee or whatever it may be? I think, and, and Clark mentioned it, in the in that building and in the, that team, they believed it from the jump. And, and, and it's understandable for people on the outside who aren't in that building every day and aren't at every workout and meeting and all that to understand that why, why would Vanderbilt think they have a chance against Alabama? But when you believe in what you're doing, you know, Clark, let's go back to the Georgia State week. You know, Clark and, and Chris, Billy, being in the media, you guys, how many coaches are as honest and forthright as Clark is? He is as honest and forthright as team is as any coach that I know of. How many coaches would tell you, well, we had a bad week? I feel, you know, we got – I don't like the way we've approached this week against Georgia State. And, unfortunately, he was right. The team played poorly. They weren't focused. You know, you can blame that on Clark, blame that on the other coaches, blame that on the – however you want to do it. But he lets you know what the team – where the pulse of the team was. He also lets you know where it was before this one. And he was right about it as well. And I think what you have to guard against is – and fans – are so fickle, you know, if we go out and lay an egg against Kentucky, they're going to say, same old Vanderbilt. Well, that's not the case, even if that does happen. It's it's a process. It's a game by game by week by week thing. You see it every week in college football. We just focus on Vanderbilt more so, so we understand that, there, you know, there's been so many times where we've been let down. And, Chris, I mentioned this to you. Oh, Luke's getting the call. <laughs> he'll, I bet he'll his be phone back in here. Wrong a lot this week. I bet it has, Chris. Another thing in that revealed type video at halftime, Clark, you know they they show him. He gets up to the team and he takes a few seconds, sort of takes a deep breath, and says, "We're let's go finish this game. We don't. There's nothing extra has to happen here in the second half as we uh, as we get Luke in here. Great video." Guys, I'm sorry. I don't know what's going on with my phone. I have no idea. It's you done this call? for the last week. Um, let me just go ahead and say that finished my thought. I don't know where it went off, but I, I want to go back to uh, <clears throat> if 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 you were if you're in that if if you were as fickle as some fans can be, you know we can go. We're capable of losing to Kentucky by 21 points or or more. But that doesn't mean that next week will be a loss or next week will be a win. You have to take this one week at a time, one game at a time, as this team has done. I think they've only played one poor game. Um, Diego Pavia cannot play as great as he's been playing. There's going to be a day when Diego has a rough day. There's going to be a day when he turns the football over. Does that mean Diego Pavia is not a great quarterback anymore? No, of course not. That's where fans get everything out of whack. Yeah. It's got to be week by week. This week, this week's game is going to be a lot tougher to win than the Alabama game was. As silly as that sounds, no, you're right. And look, there there is parity, and you guys know I, I run an SEC YouTube channel, so I'm following everybody pretty closely, and I'm starting to follow. Well, at least in the SEC, and I'm starting to follow some other teams um, outside the SEC a little bit more as we get closer to playoff time. But the parity that you're seeing in college football from week to week, I've never seen anything like it. Um, you know, you've seen you've seen Notre Dame beat Northern Illinois, which kind of proves Luke's point that you cannot take a week off. I, I think that the gap between the the middle and even the bottom of the D 
these power five leagues and the top are as little as they've ever been, which I think is a, a great opportunity for Vanderbilt that it can maybe capitalize on going forward or, or not, depending on how the school reacts to it. But I, I think it is going to come down maybe, you know, a lot of SEC football games are just like, as I've observed it over the years, you might have, you know, six or seven league games every week. And you're going, ah, blow out, blow out, blow out. Maybe this could be interesting if you squint. This will be a good game, blow out. And, like, you have maybe one or two games every week that's kind of interesting. Just about every week that conference team plays conference team, and I would probably throw Mississippi State out of that, but I think the, the other 15 teams – a lot there's a lot more latitude for anything to happen than I've ever witnessed, Luke. Yeah. Well, I mean, you just look at the Tennessee Arkansas game. Yeah. You know, Arkansas beats them with their backup quarterback. They're down 14 to three with a backup quarterback in the game. And Tennessee can't hold them <laughs> in the fourth quarter. You know, that it, 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 it's every week. There'll there'll be another upset this week. Yeah. Now we're we're a two-touchdown underdog to Kentucky, and people say, how can that be? They just beat the number one team in the nation. It's different. Guys, it's just a different and, – and look, and, and and I'm not saying this as a negative toward Diego at all, but all the media attention that he has gotten personally, you know, he's still doing stuff yeah. with John Sale or whatever yesterday. So, you know, that's a distraction, whether you want to look at yeah. it or not. It's a welcome distraction because of the, the outcome of the game. But you have to really get your focus back. I do think Diego will, but uh, that's just uh, something else you have to deal with when su when success comes your way. Yeah, they they've never been in this spot. No, no. Yeah, that, can, that's exactly what I was. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was in the locker room in '84 when we beat Alabama. Now that was not a uh, top five Alabama team. I think they were ranked, but not top five. That was when Ray Perkins was there, and it was at Alabama's homecoming. They had not been beaten in their homecoming since 1922. Wow. And we won the game handily. We were up 30 to 13 with five minutes to play. Wound up winning 30 to 21. And I remember being in that locker room and the kids were celebrating and we were 4-0 and, oh and we were ranked 17th in the nation. The next week we get beat by Tulane at home. And we only won one more game the rest of the year. So you got to guard against all that stuff. You have to. And that's what Clark is doing, I think, a great job with is letting guys know, look, we got to stick to the process. If you don't, if you'll jump, it's so easy to get back off the track. Yeah. And, and I think this is one case where having Georgia State in his pocket is useful. I mean, you wish you you wish you won that game, obviously, because then everything looks a lot different. But right. the, the one blessing of that is that's that's there for hey, don't forget. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it, you you just look at what they've got ahead, and that's it, it's obviously tough. But when we we knew Alabama, like you go back at, at the beginning of the season, and Virginia Tech starts the season with the Hokies, and then Missouri, and then Alabama. I mean, you all now we've lost Billy. I think there's something in the air, Chris. Apparently, I'm the only one safe. And I think so you far. you've got the best equipment. Well, I, I probably got the best internet too, but yeah. I want to ask you something while we're waiting for Billy to return from the ether here. Sure. <laughs> what now you what have you done? There you go. Here, here we, we go. go. All right, Billy, you finish your thought. I'm sorry. I was just saying, you know, people keep saying, you know, you got, you got a tough schedule ahead. Well, Vanderbilt's already beaten Virginia Tech, Alabama. You almost beat Missouri. I mean, like you said, Luke probably eight plays away or so from being five and zero oh right now, but but they're not. So that's the thing. If Vanderbilt plays Vanderbilt football, if they play to their style and they and they play the way they played against Alabama and Virginia Tech, that that's the you go back. That's the blueprint for this team. If they do that, they can beat anybody. They, I mean that 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 is a fact. And so, uh, but. Like you said, Luke, it's not always easy to go out and do that. So that's the challenge. Can this team continue to be consistent? How much did that week leading up to Georgia State teach them? You know, because I mean, obviously, I feel like it did a lot because he came back in Missouri and almost beat Missouri. Uh, but this is, like you said, Chris, is a new challenge. And when you have something brand new like that, that can be hard to 
hard hard to fight against. So that that's that's the big challenge for Clark right now. Luke, go I've got a go ahead. Go I'm sorry. No, I was just gonna say, you know, styles make fights. And yeah. I've told people and, and they look at me like I've got two heads. I said, guys, this weekend's matchup against Kentucky is tougher for Vanderbilt than the matchup with yes. Alabama. Yes. <laughs> because of their defensive front, because of the discipline that Alabama does not play with at times, because they I think that if Kalen DeBoer, if I had one criticism of him right now, it's that his kids are so good athletically that sometimes they just rely on their athleticism and don't, you know, Saturday it showed that they don't necessarily stay in their gaps and do what they're supposed to do. Because those were a bunch of five stars and four stars that Vanderbilt just ran up and down the field, drug them up and down the field for 32 minutes. And you don't see that with a disciplined Alabama team. So I think he's got to work on that. The, the talent is there for them to not lose another game. But uh, our matchup with Kentucky, their defensive front, their two tackles are NFL ready. Really good. They're really good, and they're huge. And they can uh, cause problems. They, they can wreak havoc in that backfield. And that's how you stop a Vanderbilt offense is you get inside and disrupt and, and, and get them off of what, what Diego wants to do where he's comfortable and get into a rhythm. And we all know that that's the formula for, the, for Vanderbilt to win. No turnovers, no penalties or limited penalties, and that type of the way they play. Now, they're not going to hold the ball for 32 minutes against Kentucky because Kentucky, when they get the ball, they have the same philosophy we do. They hold the ball. Yeah. Yeah. It could be a short game, and for Vanderbilt to win, I think you're looking at a 17-14 type game. I, I thought Kentucky was the most underrated team. They and Oklahoma coming into the season. Oklahoma had just a rash of injuries to the offensive line and the receiver room, which which has kind of wrecked their season to date, although they're still, I think, 4-1. and one. Yeah. But Kentucky, and, and after the South Carolina game, that looked like a dumb take. But South Carolina, for whatever reason, has their number. I, I think it's like there's one team that's got everybody's number. They got our theirs. Yeah, and, and ask Ole Miss how tough that defensive line was. They slowed down an Ole Miss team. Now, granted, Ole Miss had not played much of anybody, but I think Ole Miss may be a legit top-five team nationally. Yeah. And Kentucky beat them in Oxford. So I, I think they are a very tough matchup. They're, they're not ranked, but I think they are top-25 talent and just because of how much has been done on defense. And they've got more offensive talent than they've done anything with. But, Luke, I want to – before we go to the mailbag, I want to ask you a, a question. I don't want to linger here too long, but I look back to – you called this year three, and I, in a sense I agree with you. And I think where I disagree, a coach is responsible for his own stuff, and I think that he was too loyal to an awful defensive coordinator, Nick Howell. And I think uh, a coordinator on Joey Lynch – I never thought Lynch was his – awful as people thought, but clearly a different approach has worked better. Um, and I thought that they were naive. I mean, you can go back. There's receipts on this. I thought when they were losing starters to other schools who would then go and be backups for more money, I thought that their NIL approach was misguided. Uh, and and I, that's, I think that's where I fought them more. Now, look, I know that you have to deal with the school to get resources for coaches and for, for players, um, and, and I don't know where the blame starts with Clark and ends with other people. I think Clark has taken a lot of bullets for other people in the process, too. I think you would agree with that based on the the stuff that we've kind of not aired publicly. Uh, but I, in all that, I, I look back and I think, you know, it, it felt like, in, in a way, the worst thing that could have happened to them was to win those games against Florida and Kentucky two years ago because it felt a, it, it probably felt like validation of an approach that was going to fail, and and boy, it it did last year. So this was the reset off season to find something that worked. Is that all those things fair? Uh, yeah, I, I agree with pretty much all of that. the The only thing I would say is. Probably one of the reasons we have what we have right now is because New Mexico State beat Auburn. Yes. If that doesn't happen. You know, Clark was searching. Clark was in a, you know, he was during the season, after the season, he knew about six games, six in that we, he's going to have to make staff changes and a lot of changes in philosophy and everything else. And then when he saw that New Mexico State, who had less talent than we did, handle Auburn at Auburn. He said, that's what we need. And luckily, 
and with uh, it's not just luck it's his personality and someone wanting to come to work for him at, at a place like Vanderbilt you got to think about that too yeah. people say well it's just a, give Jerry Kill and all of them they're the ones that get 100 percent of the credit no uh, they wouldn't be there without Clark and their yeah. belief you don't go to work for somebody who you think can't get it done. And uh, so that's, that's, that's where I stand on that stuff. Uh, that, that was a huge win that Clark really studied and watched over and over again at how is New Mexico state beating in Auburn and wanted to change that style. Billy, I'll have you get the mailbag ready. I've got a follow-up question for Luke. And I, I know what is, I guess it'll begin with a statement. I know for a fact that after the UNLV game, they were like, okay, something's got to be different. And not long after that, they knew that that started with quarterback mobility. So I know the quarterback room knew before the season was over, and credit to Clark for being honest with them, knew that they were, you know, on on the way out. I mean, in other words, this the offense we are going to run going forward no longer is going to fit you. I don't know that they knew what it looked like at that point, enter Jerry Kill and Tim Beck, but that is the way that I heard it. They had already started thinking, you know, before last season even was at the midpoint or close to it, that, all right, we're going to try – and at that point, last season was just kind of a a waste because you had kids out the door knowing that they were not going to be needed next year. Or, or I'm not going to say not needed. I'm not going to say that somebody couldn't have stuck around as a, a third or fourth quarterback as an insurance policy, but they knew that they could go find places where their skills would fit a lot better than whatever they were about to run. Yeah, that's fair. And, you know, I, I'll be honest with you. If, if you think the kids don't still respect Clark Lee, look who was back at the game down there celebrating and hugging him the other night. That was incredible. Ken yeah. Seed- uh, AJ Swan. There's a lot of kids back the other night. Some just for their teammates. I understand that. There's still friendships, but uh, I saw a lot of them engaging with Clark, and that that says a lot. There's a lot of you know. Th- there's so much animosity in this co- in college football, and and you know you're mad. Well, your kid leaves. Well, that kid's dead to me, and all that crap. That's that's just the climate we're that's in right part now. Part of it. It's part of it. It's no one's fault. It's just uh you know if you want to blame somebody, br- blame Congress. Was Will Shepard there? Was that true? I, oh, I didn't see him. I saw Swan. I, I heard. Be shocked. I heard Shepard was there, but I, I was. That's I didn't crazy. believe it either. Yeah, I never yeah. saw. Him. I, I didn't see him. I saw Swan. I saw Seals. I saw. Uh, there was one other kid I saw. I can't remember who it is, but anyway, that has transferred. And there yeah. goes. Well, I know I texted texted the Seals family um, a couple nights ago. And I I hate they couldn't be part of it. I mean, Ken was great Vanderbilt through and through. A phenomenal family. Um, I mean, it's been a good story, but that is what you hate is some people that kind of laid some of the building blocks for this couldn't couldn't be part of it. But um, yeah. Anyway, um, hey, I think Bill fell into the mailbag. He might have fallen into the mailbag. Um, Maybe maybe Billy needs some some clarity. His I'm having major, clarity. major internet issues. I don't know what's going on. I think I am too. I'm just glad I'm still able. To, I don't know. It, it could go out anytime. I got yeah, the mailbag. It, but let's go with the well, mailbag. But before we get to the mailbag, um, you guys may need some clarity on what's wrong with your internet. And when you need clarity, that's what you get, Magic Mind. It's a busy time around here unpacking this Alabama game and what's ahead i don't have a lot of downtime i don't need stress distractions any lack of energy to get in my way magic mind is great for dealing with those things i've sampled their product it's terrific it is a mental performance shot that keeps you clear and motivated and reduces stress it has helped me gain a clear head and much needed focus through some stressful and hectic days this summer and fall it's not a coffee replacement there are no quick fixes but is in addition to your morning routine with time release caffeine if you want the scientific explanation for why it works completely safe 12 all natural ingredients to support your body's energy engine mushroom nootropics adaptogens 
over 100% of your daily vitamin C and D in every bottle. It has been Dr. Valaday with over 200 scientific studies behind every ingredient. It donates a nickel of every bottle sold to mental health charities that help U.S. homeless communities. So confident is Magic Mind it can help you. It will refund your money 100%, no questions asked if you don't like it. Check out Magic Mind. Get 48% off a subscription or 20% off a one-time purchase with the code BandySports20. Go to magicmind.com forward slash Fandy Sports. Magic Mind, where Flow State awaits you. All right, Mailbag is presented by our friends at Sutherland and Belk. Hopefully you never need a family-owned, hopefully you never need a law firm to deal with injuries. But if you do, <clears throat> Southern Belk and Belk is a family-owned injury law firm. Russell Belk and Taylor Sutherland, wonderful human beings. Um, if you were ever hurt in an accident, call them 615-846-6200. See what your rights are and if they can help. Longest-running sponsor of the show. We really appreciate those guys. John Levin is good friend of the show, Wobble Bond Dickinson. It's his company, which thanks the student athletes at Vanderbilt University for their dedication, effort, and hard work. Also sponsored by Yaman Packaging Systems, leaders in end-of-line packaging automation. Billy, what's up in the mailbag? All right, let's start with Jordan Hayes, 49. Other than the win against Alabama this past weekend, what are some of your favorite memories from Vandy football? Mine are beating Tennessee for the first time in my lifetime in 2005 and the 2008 season, experiencing Vandy's first winning season. Yeah, I mean, obviously you guys will be different uh, than me. I'll say I went to the 2008 Auburn game. That was that was pretty special. Um, and then the Music City Bowl that year. Was, I mean, I go back. Those are core memories, uh, you know, of me going to Vanderbilt football games. And then, you know, beating Tennessee, I think, you know, it was the year they, they – uh, they were headed to the Sugar Bowl, they all thought, and Vanderbilt knocks them off. Um, I mean, there's not there's not a ton, uh, but I, I would definitely throw one of the one of the Tennessee Tennessee wins in there. I think that that year they had thoughts of the Sugar Bowl was uh, was was pretty tasteful. So that's uh, that's what I'll say. Luke, well, I'm so old, I've got too many. I'll bore you guys with mine, but. Of the nine, Vanderbilt's only been to nine bowls, and I've been to eight of them. So, those eight bowls, of course, uh, even when we didn't win, were still uh, pretty fun. Um, in 1974, when we beat Tennessee in Knoxville, uh, that was when Fred Pankos was our coach, 17 14. Uh, just the, uh, in, you know, there's been so many, there has been more than you'd think. If you go down through, there's at least been one every other year or two every other year. Uh, too many to count. The ones that stand out to me, I think this will be number one, but I, I think a close second was 05 Tennessee. I think that was the year, wasn't it? When they went to Knoxville and, and the, the Cutler to Bennett game, I was in the press box. It just, they had lost that game so many times. It, it wasn't, it was just like, if not, it's not if, but when. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, that was one like oh it does it doesn't always end this way. I think the uh, the twenty twelve Tennessee game with James Franklin where they just whipped them, and I was on the field and Vanderbilt actually had Tennessee outnumbered in the stadium and um, everybody's celebrating. That was one that that I'll remember because that one was like wow you know because at that point it had been a while since they'd beaten Tennessee. They won that game then and then they resumed losing. I think the other one was the the, the last. Or the the Kyle Shermer Tennessee game where they they knocked him out of the the Sugar Bowl uh, yep. was was another one that was a that was kind of a wow moment but but there haven't been many they've been been many years apart. All right, ATL door. I know the coaches and players are saying all the right things about moving on and getting ready for Kentucky, but with the celebration and attention the past few days, do you expect a letdown game, or does being two touchdown underdogs keep them motivated and focused? I think this team is 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 locked in right now more than we've seen a Clark Lee team locked in. Yesterday, he was on on with George and I, and he said they had their best practice GPS wise on Tuesday ever. So, I, I, mm -hmm. and and like you said, Luke, whenever 
Clark says they're coming off a good practice and a good week. You know what's happened. He's hitting a thousand. Um, so I, that's why I'm interested to talk to him today uh, to see how yesterday and, and today went. But I think that that underdog, you know, Diego Pavia mentioned it yesterday in an interview, said we're two touchdown dogs. So, you know, I guess Vegas, you know, still doesn't know. You know, Clark mentioned it yesterday as well. He said, I saw where we're two touchdown underdogs. You know, so they've got to go out there and earn that. Um, you know, that I'm not stunned by the line. I'm a little surprised it's that high, but that I, I do think that's a, a good piece of motivation for them. Um, but yeah, you're going to be riding high with confidence, but I, I think the core of this team is Diego Pavia and that offense, but he's also helped bring some other leaders in, I think defensively, whether it's CJ Taylor. So I don't expect a letdown game. I'm not expecting Vanderbilt to come out here and dominate. Um, against Kentucky, I think it'll be close. Uh, but no, Luke, I'm not. I'm not expecting. I'm not expecting a letdown game. Well, <clears throat> the thing that concerns me about Saturday, probably besides obviously the style of play by both teams, is uh, <clears throat> our injury report. We have a lot of guys that are going to play, but aren't 100. percent And that not being 100, percent especially if it's a lower body where you're not moving as fast or reacting as fast. <clears throat> can make a big difference. You can make for big plays on, and because six of those guys, I think, are on defense that are questionable. Yeah, I'm more worried about other things. I think Luke said it early that like they've turned the ball over once in five games. Just <laughs> by was- dumb luck, that's going to end. And, and you hope that, that for their sake, it doesn't end with like a minus three in in a spot like this, because then it's it's probably over before it started. If that's the case, I think that's one thing. The range of outcomes is right before you. If they don't show up, they can get beat by Georgia State. And if they show up and, and play their A game, they can beat pretty much anybody, which is sounds crazy, but you just saw it. Yeah. Denver Door, last Saturday was a program-changing win. What have you heard in regards of NIL donations, recruiting gossip, facility enhancements, or other buzz that have been a result of said victory? NIL donations, I mean, you've seen it on social media, whether it's Skip Bayless, um, Brant Snedeker, you know, all kinds of, you know, Nate Bargatze, all kinds of people that have encouraged fans to give to Anchor Impact, uh, which means they've likely given. Um, I, I've heard good things that that Vanderbilt had a nice wave of, of NIL dollars a, after the win. I mean, how could you not, especially with all with all the auction items? Um, and you've got a player as marketable as Diego Pavia. So I'd say the, the, the NIL money's coming in for him. Recruiting gossip, uh, I think most people know by now that Stefan Shivers is a guy that um, that they're working on right now. Um, so I think I would definitely keep an eye on him. Uh, facility enhancements, that's a good one. I, I think that's a good question, to, you know, because obviously, Chris, you've talked about some concern in that area. Uh, I wonder if, if that win changes any of that one way or the other um so i mean look nil donations i I can't imagine um i i can't imagine a a better win to uh to to bring maybe some donors that were waiting uh you know to 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 come back on board fully well it it was a signature win and that's what you know that's a often used phrase but it really was and i think like you just said that's what some people were waiting on so i think there was a, a bump there I also think this, when you have a win like that, you know, it's one of them things, the hot dogs and the popcorn taste better and people aren't complaining about all the ancillary Mm -hmm. stuff. And I think that helps. That just calms the waters a little bit. Uh, And and what you hope is that you have to do a good job. And I, and I will say this, I want to give credit to the athletic department. I think they've capitalized with all the, you know, as much as information that can, can be put out about that game, they've done it. And doing the thing with Nick Saban at the end is a non-Vanderbilt. Mm. So I, I praise them for doing that stuff because we've had stuff shoved in our face for years, and they took a pot shot there, and I have no problem with that. Yeah, I think – I know as of last week, they were not in a great place financially with much of anything. Uh, I will keep a lot of the details to myself to protect a, a couple of people, but – I was concerned. I, I think that when it, it's like Luke said, every the hot dogs taste better, everything. Like when that happens, people come out of the woodwork 
to help you out. I, I think that I don't know that they had much of an NIL plan a week ago. And I, I think the the win jump started that. I'll give them credit when I'm driving to the press conference Tuesday from Franklin. What do I see in 100 Oaks on one of those electronic billboards to the right side as you're heading up 65 North? There's a, a billboard with anchor impact and and also, you know, the, the final score. They did have on the ribbon board some stuff about anchor impact. So I think that, look, I think you've got a lot of people out there waiting for proof of concept. Nobody wants to throw money after a bad product. And so I think that opens up a lot of possibilities for them. Right. The G Barks 24, two of Andy's biggest plays this season have come from local players. The the C Brooks interception against Virginia Tech and then the Cheryl fourth and one catch. Can Vandy use this momentum to get some more local players in recruiting? I think I think absolutely. And I'm not saying they've been they've been lacking, but they've been lacking in getting the that dude, you know, from the mid state. You know, they and, and I think they would tell you that that, you know, we've gotten some some solid players, and, and, and you talk about London Humphreys, the guys at Georgia now. Um, so they've gotten some pretty good local players, uh, but I think they know that they can even go out and get some of the kids that that have maybe looked at Vanderbilt and have said, you know, I, I'm not going to worry about that right now. I've got a, you know, I've got a Georgia offer, I've got an LSU offer, you know, I've got Tennessee looking at me. Um, so, but the other thing is, you know, you've got Tennessee fighting with you for those if you're if you're in that. Um, you know, if you're in that avenue with those players, but Luke, I, I think you know absolutely. And there's a couple, there's some more rumors of of uh, of, of some other flips. Uh, Vanderbilt flipped a kid from Mississippi State, um, you know, right at right after the win. So, and not not from Nashville, but um, that is something that Luke. I think there's another level of mid state locking down the mid state uh, for this team. That's what James Franklin talked about. I know this program wants to do that. I don't think they're there yet, but I think this win. I mean, for a local kid. You know, like a like a Cheryl to do what he did in Seabrooks. Oh man, that, that kid played it played high school in Nashville. You know, if you're a local high school player, seeing that, uh, I think that's a good thing. But I think there's another level for them in terms of mid state recruiting. Luke. Uh, I, I agree with that. However, I also think it's just as important because statewide and nationwide, this was covered, so yeah. it helped recruiting in general. Period. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's, uh, you know, when, when Coach Franklin was here, he he recruited a couple of kids out of Memphis and then a Zuba K out of Nashville and, and some other kids. Uh, it's it's all about the winning, guys. It, it, it yeah. doesn't matter. You know, there's a lot of kids that would love to stay at home and go to Vanderbilt that are in Nashville, mid, mid-state area. And, and now that they've seen, hey, you know, it just opens their eyes to it. So, yes, it absolutely helps. Yeah, to that, I got – I've still got about – I don't know, 30 or 40 text messages. I haven't even had time to open yet. People all over the country. Yeah. That like, I mean, literally one guy that I hadn't heard from in at least a decade, you know, and, and I'm not even Vanderbilt fans. Like, wow, I'm, I'm watching this. This is incredible. I got a, you know, I, I, I got a text from the pastor who married us. Um, who's was a former Nebraska offensive lineman starter, got drafted in the NFL. Doesn't not really a big football guy. He, he he played it because he was good at, it, but he doesn't really care. He texts me after the game. Um, wow, you know, so like people that don't even normally pay attention were watching. But I think the the local angle, like I've said this for years, I feel like it's easier to get a blue chip recruit outside the area because they don't have to come in and see it in the stadium. And like it is as ironic as you know, I know Luke talked about the Saban comment. In a way, Saban was right. I mean, you had five or 6,000 Vanderbilt fans in the stadium. So even as Vanderbilt's winning the game, it's overcoming its own stadium. But I, I think that if you show proof of concept and all of a sudden it's not awful and you can win games and you're not outnumbered in your own stadium, it's very attractive for local kids suddenly. Let, let's say you beat Tennessee at the end of the year, which I think is maybe on the table now. Long, A lot of time between now and then, maybe Tennessee figures – some stuff out, maybe Vanderbilt comes back down to earth, or, or maybe Tennessee got exposed for some things. Like that game at the end of the year, if you can get that one, that's a big thing. There's, there's a lot of work to do. This was a first step that shows the possibilities. But, yeah, I think that if you play your cards right, if you get your NIL stuff in order, if you if you finish your facilities, and I would say, hey, 
you get the why not work on the end zone thing and get that finished for the spring game so you can give tours and get out ahead of it don't just don't just meet the deadline for fall i think this is a wonderful opportunity for vanderbilt if it plays its cards right absolutely i mean you they've talked about you got to leverage this you've got to find a way to keep the eyes on you you know this is a golden opportunity you've got the eyes of the country you're all of a sudden you're gonna have more people watching that 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 kentucky game keep them on you because all of a sudden i don't want to jinx it but you win these next couple of games college game day is coming for the texas game i mean that's i, I think i think that's probably a given there um all right we got a couple more uh, let's see, GBARKS24, this is a good one. With more defenses keying in on Eli Stowers, does this open up more opportunities for players like Cole Spence, Bryson Coleman, and Quincy Skinner in the passing game? I would throw Cheryl in there uh, as well. And, yeah, Bryson Coleman was uh, was, out, was out there on the field. I, I, I think Coleman is a guy that, that can help this team. I mean, it might take a little bit. Um, but, Luke, that's something. I think they have so many ways to get Stowers the football that I don't know that there's ever going to be a game where – and maybe a team will shut him down. I mean, I'm probably wrong in saying that. But, man, they mixed it up with him. I mean, you know, and he's so versatile. That first down he got to stretch out, um, you know, I think early in that second half was massive. Um, so, yeah, there will be days where you've got to get Cheryl and Skinner more involved. But I was really impressed. And we talked about that leading up to the game, Chris, how – Vanderbilt's got to find a way to get Skinner and Cheryl more involved. And and they did. And you, you saw Cheryl on the fourth and one. Skinner had a couple of big catches. And so, Luke, I think it does. But I don't know that Stower, Stowers is just so versatile the way they use him. I think they'll be able to pretty consistently get him the football, even if it's short throws here or there. You know, he's obviously not much of a deep threat, especially the shuffle pass. I mean, that thing came out of nowhere. And they yeah. run it, ran it, ran it twice to perfection. Well, the thing that the reason why Eli is always going to be there is because he and Pavi have such a great chemistry together yeah. as friendships and as football players. And look, we are, everybody has one. You know, every team has a go-to guy. Uh, he's become that. However, within this offense, you know, you. I, and if you guys may have noticed it in some other games. I know the Georgia State game, there was one drive when Eli Stowers seemed to get the ball seven or eight times in a row. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be a drive during the game where they're going to concentrate, where he and Diego are going to say, all right, let's, it's me and you on this drive. But there's so many options with this offense. And at the last second, the decision-making by Diego so far has been immaculate almost. And he's not going to be that every time. That's, I mean, we've played five football games, and like Chris said, we've had one turnover. That's got to lead the nation. Has to. Yeah. And, you know, that, that so the, I, I, I just think that Eli's going to be there no matter what. I left fall camp thinking that Spence and Cheryl were their top two most talented targets. Now, Stowers obviously has had a phenomenal season. He's the, the guy to watch. But I'm just saying they've – You've seen what Quincy Skinner has done at times, you know, and now Cheryl emerged. I still think Cole Spence is out there, you know, to, to do some big things for them if they can dial into it. So I, I think the good news is you maybe got more talented options than any of us would have suspected yeah. going into the fall. Yep. All right. I think this is the last one here. Luke has been preaching the Clark Lee gospel even when other Vandy fans had already given up on him. How many victory laps have you run since the win on Saturday, Luke? No victory laps except for the fact that uh, I have, I'm not going to hide that I, a fact that I like Clark and we are friends. I've known Clark since he came to Vanderbilt and I first fitted him in a helmet. I knew he was a class kid then. And uh, I know he's got a great family. And, uh, and I want to share something with you guys that probably no one ever thinks about. And all these highlights and videos and clips and photos – the one I enjoyed the most was Clark hugging his son at the end. And I'll tell you why. Uh, and Derek Mason caught some of this when he was here with his children. Uh, think about this. You know, children can be cruel. And when things haven't gone good, like just think about the, the, the school last year for that young man when he goes in and you, you hear, your dad sucks, y'all don't win enough games. Mm -hmm. and stuff. When that kid was crying and happy for his dad, that, that, that made me uh, that made me tear up because I know what they go through 
And uh, for you people out there that call him bad names and stuff like that, that's not necessary because he's a good man. And he's probably a better man than I know he's a better man than me. Probably a lot better man than those people who criticize him. Yeah, with with every I mean, we've worked with him, Chris. You've worked with him from the beginning. Just one of the nicest people. Yeah, you, I think you, you you're around. I mean, he he really does care about everybody. Um, and yeah, it's been hard. I mean, the, the build has been hard, uh, but this is some, some deserved validation for him and, and his staff. There's so many other people. It's, it's a good, there, there's great people everywhere in that, in that program. Yes. I mean, you, you just don't. Yeah. And I like the point that you said, Luke, you don't see the honesty that Clark Lee gives. And, and I was, you know, I saw it a little bit from, from Kalen DeBoer. I watched his Tuesday, uh, presser last week and, and you can tell when a coach is, is just is not is not on you know he's a little off in terms of you know hesitation you know Clark never has any hesitation when he's talking about his team so his pulse of the team has been really impressive and um, you know I don't like you said this isn't unbelievable to them Chris I thought that was a really good point you thought they were in shock but yeah. after, you know as this week has progressed you know they took care of business and it's the best win in program history. And that uh, that goes deeper than anything James Franklin did uh, at Vanderbilt, which I don't know that pe anybody thought would happen. I've covered some coaches that I thought were were really good people. I've covered some coaches I thought were really bad people, and I've covered some coaches that had really good qualities and, and really awful qualities at the same time. Uh, but but I think Clark is at or near the top of the list of of good people I've covered. We've we've had to be critical at times. It's not personal. I mean, when when you when you have the season they had last year, if you don't call stuff out, you're not doing your job. But you are happy for people when they have success. Who who I think are the kind of person that Clark is, and I was was really happy for him exiting Saturday. And a lot of other people, though. I remember seeing Earl Bennett, is, and I don't really know Earl that well, but I know what you think of him, Luke, and I know what a lot of other people think of him. There, are, there's some really good people in that building, and some good players on that team that you couldn't help but be happy for. Yeah. Well, one more thing on the way out, Luke. You know the the moment, and it kind of hit me. I was doing Neil McCready's podcast. He runs some stuff on the Ole and he had me on. I think it'll air. May have even aired by now, but it'll be out. And he asked me a lot of questions. We spent about an hour with him just asking me stuff. And, and it kind of occurred to me, the, the one of the things that it most felt like, it was like when I was a kid watching the, the Miracle on Ice. When you're just like, there's no way this should have happened, but it's happening right in front of us. And oh my goodness. Um. What a story. It almost had that kind of feeling when I was watching the clock run down at the end of that one. I, I, Chris, I think I shared this with you. My most prideful moment during the game was in the last 245 because how many times has a Vanderbilt team not been able to run out the clock and not give yeah. one more? And, and, yeah. and not on. the fact that we got three first downs, one by penalty, but three first downs to, to kneel on the ball, kneel on the yeah. ball, number one team in the country. And yeah. that's, that's, that's amazing. And to hold them to nine possessions, they had the football nine times. That's it. Yeah. You know, that's, it's impressive. They had a script that they had to execute to perfection. And I think they executed their script to perfection about as well as I've ever seen a Vanderbilt team do in any sport. Yeah. And, and one more thing here. I want to give credit to the the, the blockers. Uh, Cole Spitz yes. had a great day blocking. Gabe Fisher, uh, a good family friend of mine, went to NBA. I mean, he's Clark Lee. I, I mean, uh, he, he, he is, he's Clark Lee, um, but blocked really well. Ma Manny Adebay had a tremendous block. I mean, they bullied Alabama. They yeah. physically dominated Alabama. Yeah. And I think that that was what was most surprising about it, not to the team, of course, but just how physical they were on offense. They knew they could run the football um, and Alabama was was lost. They were lost on defense. So I want to give credit to the tight ends, but but on, but particularly the fullbacks, especially late there. They just took away the will of Alabama 
And that's what Alabama usually does to, to teams. One more quick point I want to make that I'm going to give Klanakis and Beck credit on something, moving LaSoya to guard and Castillo to center. Yeah. Because there was getting to be a little bit, a lot of penetration up the middle in that gap. And that uh, that did not happen much Saturday. There were so many big things that happened in that game. Like I thought Tim Beck's play calling was A plus. I, I thought the the offensive line played well. The the move that you said was a big thing. There were just so many positives coming out of that game and, and people that deserve superlatives that that you couldn't even comprehend them. Like I'll give you another example. Brian Longwell got some kind of national defensive player of the week award this week. I don't know that we mentioned Brian Longwell at any point. Yeah. He's been, he's been really good today. I mean, and, and, and that's my point. Like you had so much stuff, so many guys that played well, so many coaches that came with the right game plan that we're sitting here four days later, unpacking stuff that we didn't get to and, and probably should have, but it was, it was just that kind of week. I've, I've never had a week in my history of covering the program that was anything like this, not even close. You know, guys, we talked about at the first of the year before the season started, get the guy on either side of the ball that you think would be key or surprise. I'm not sure how it was phrased, but my pick was Randon Fontenet, and yeah. he turned out to be a blessing, man. That kid has been around the football. He, You know, you, you, he may not be in the tackle, but he's either corralling or doing what he has to, or make a big pick like he had Saturday. Whatever it, it may be, Randon's always around the football. Miles Capers, credit to him to to get yep. that, not just to sack him, but they teach that, take the ball out, and then Isa Hotaha falls on it. That was the play of the game. I mean, that I think that's for most people. You could say the fourth and one, I think, that when, when general fans were like, uh-oh, this might happen, but for me – for for you and I, Chris, I think that was when we looked at each other and went, "Uh oh, uh, th this yeah. this thing here, this thing might happen here." So well, um, and you know, yeah, credit to, to the Cedric. defense. Yeah, yeah, Cedric Alexander, another guy had a good game statistically, not on paper, doesn't look like much. I thought he played really well. Had some big runs, tough yards. Yeah. Uh, it just it just there's just so many guys that had a big role in this game and they'll probably never get their names mentioned publicly, but it was that kind of day. Yeah. And we haven't talked about Kentucky at all. <laughs> well, we we'll did have a little bit, but a little bit, a little bit. And that, and that, but guys, that that's a tough matchup. If they win that one, that will be a really nice one. I, I think there's a lot of stuff stacked against them. If I'm being honest. Yeah. Uh, but, but if, if boy, if they go up and get that one, then, you're, you're looking at a potentially really special season. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. And I, I last thing on Kentucky, I look at offensively. Kentucky's not great offensively. So but they're I th talented. But yeah, they've, they've got some guys to watch. If you let Barry on Brown get loose, that, that's going to be a problem. You know, they've got a good running back in Kong Bay and Vandegrift can run around a little bit. So, and they're coming off a couple of weeks of prep. So, the this is going to be a dogfight. I mean, this this is likely going to be low scoring, like you said, Luke. Um, and I can't wait to watch it. But it's it's going to be interesting, like you said, Chris. If Vanderbilt gets this win, all of a sudden they're in a little bit of a driver's seat. Uh, you know, for yeah. for a lot of good things to happen to them. All right. Uh, unless you guys have got parting thoughts, uh, and if you do, let me know. Luke, you good? I'm good. All right. Well, thank you for watching the roundtable edition of the Vanda Sports Podcast. We'll do another one as we usually do next Thursday. Thank you to our sponsors. Thank you for watching. Leave a thumbs up. Hit the subscribe button on YouTube if you haven't. Give us a nice rating where you find these on podcasts. Visit our sponsors. All the things that help keep this alive. For Luke White and Billy Darrett, I'm Chris Lee. You've been listening to and watching the Vandy Sports Podcast.